everyone. Uh, I can see a few of you have started to join. Uh, we're going to give it a few minutes um, for the 156 people that signed up for this to join in. I'm sure there'll be um, some people that straddle in a little bit late, um, uh, but we'll give it a few minutes uh, before we get started. Um, Just in case uh, you need a reminder on where you are, um, hopefully you can see uh, the screen we're showing. So we're going. This is a uh, Nplan's first ever webinar. Um, so I hope you'll bear with us uh, as as we're also learning how to communicate uh, and share messages over over these forums. But I'm 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 sure we've all got our stories on how we're learning um, uh, uh, to communicate in new ways right now. Well, the good news is that out of 156 participants, most are on time. Okay, I'm gonna kick off um, and um, I've got the least important, um, least important job of the day today, which is uh, housekeeping and welcome. Um, so uh, thank you again for joining the, the webinar uh, to discuss uh, the identification and preparation, how to better identify and prepare for black swan. Um, we've got a really great uh, bit of content that we'd love to share with you today. Um, and that content will be delivered by Dr. Dougal Goodman and Professor Yao Krishka Kokain and Alan Mosca. Um, and I'll introduce them uh, in, with some more information in a second. Um, but I'll start with uh, the, some basic housekeeping. Um, we are using Zoom webinars. Um, and in case you've not used this before, uh, Zoom webinars is, is sort of like Zoom, but it has a few different uh, changes to it. Uh, the first is, uh, you, you will largely be seeing the panelists on the screen. So unfortunately, there's not so much room for networking amongst the attendees on, on this uh, in here. Um, I'm not sure we can manage uh, 100 different simultaneous conversations over one uh, Zoom call. So for that matter, you are unfortunately all automatically muted. Um, and uh, if you would like to talk or you'd like to ask a question, uh, you can do that in two ways. Uh, the first way uh, is you can write a question. So uh, you can write, ask a question directly to the panelists using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, and we, we'll, we as the panelists will get to see that on, on our screens. Um, you can also um, talk to all members, uh, everyone in the, in the room. So a few people have been saying hello. Uh, we have people that have joined in from Japan, from Australia, which we recognize how incredibly late in the evening it is for you. So thank you so much for being here with us. And we've got people all the way on the other side of the world in the US. Uh, so good morning to you. Um, what, uh, this is a discussion. So uh, to, to my point, I do want to stress that we really do want you to ask questions as we go along. Um, there will be times when we will activate microphones and invite you to speak. Uh, but initially, we'd please ask that just because of the numbers and trying to manage this, that you ask for your questions or using the Q&A feature. But please do ask questions. The second thing is that we are going to be running polls. So polls are dead easy. Um, Sophie, who's uh, running all the logistics of this webinar in the background, will activate a poll at the right time. Uh, and you'll get uh, a question pop up on your screen, just simply answer the question. Uh, and of course, we're going to be sharing all of those results with you so you get to see how others are thinking and feeling. Um, and with that, I'll get going. So, um, Enplan, uh, we're, we're hosting the webinar. This is us when we had an office and we were all together. Uh, we look a little different now. We've had uh, four new team members join since this photograph was taken and since uh, we stopped all working in that same office, uh, but we are still all here. We're, we're um, enjoying the, the new reality of how uh, we work. Um, and we are, for those that don't know, a company that uses data 
on past construction projects to generate quantitative predictions on what might go wrong next on a construction project. Um, a few of you use us on your projects today. A few of you have thought about using us and a few of you are just interested in the concepts that we like talking about at NPLAN. Uh, we as a business uh, have been going for a, a two and a half years. Uh, we, we work across the world, which is why so many of you have joined from all around the world uh, to be here with us. And with that, um, I'll introduce our three really cool speakers. Um, I'll start with Professor Yael Grishka Kokain. Um, Yael is a good, really good friend of us. Uh, we met her uh, after I replied to her. Um, she was featured on Freakonomics, which is a really cool podcast. Uh, and I listened to it and I was like, oh my God, this is a person that I have to go and meet. And I sent her a tweet and she replied to it. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, we've, uh, we found a great intersection in her work uh, in, in, this, in decision analysis and forecasting and project management. Uh, Yael teaches at Harvard Business School uh, and is also an award-winning teacher there. In 2014, she was named as one of 21 thought leader professors in data science. And isn't it amazing that a thought leader professor works in the field of uh, decision management, project management, and forecasting. Uh, so we're thrilled that she's been able to join us today from Boston. Um, and we have Dr. Dougal Goodman, uh, who's another very serendipitous meet, um, a, a great friend of us uh, here at NPLAN. Uh, Dr. Goodman um, is a, um, it has, has had a very wide ranging career, so I'm not, I can't even begin to attempt to summarize the whole thing. Um, but he spent a number of years at BP um, working uh, as the head of, their head of safety. Uh, and I'm sure you can understand uh, what uh, that might look like as um, in terms of understanding risk and, uh, and events or, and or extreme events. Uh, Dr. Goodman or Dougal has been uh, the chief executive of the, the Foundation for Science and Technology uh, and, and is also the editor of the foundation's journal now. Um, he, it, across his illustrious career, he's, he's worked in insurance, uh, in underwriting, uh, and has, has really helped spearhead uh, some key initiatives um, around the understanding of risk um, uh, and, and doing some of that work with the Lloyds of London. Um, so, and, and of course, my last but not least is my dear uh, co-founder, Alan Mosca. I promise you'll see the smiley version of Alan uh, when he starts talking over uh, the, the webinar. But Alan has, uh, is working to complete his very long standing PhD uh, in his spare time. Um, uh, and in, in his day job, he acts as the chief technology officer of NPLAN. Uh, he is uh, the architect, the vision behind all of the engineering that has gone behind uh, creating NPLAN's product from uh, what was initially a very wild and slightly stupid idea uh, to what it is today, which is a product that actually works. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, hand it off to Alan to start and give us an overview of the, the, what we're going to talk, to talk about today and, and share his thoughts from there onwards. Thanks, Dev. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen with a couple of slides. Um, so welcome, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining. I thought I'd give a little bit of a background um, so that we can all start the, uh, the discussion at the same level. And um, for those of us who have only recently heard of the terms black swans, extreme events, and extreme statistics, it should at least give us a picture so that we can then discuss what is the application to projects? How does it affect me? Um, so. A quick reminder, what is a black swan? So some of you will already know this, but a black swan is a type of extreme event which uh, has to follow three characteristics. One is that it's an extreme event that is extremely rare. Um, and that usually also means that it's an event that is not uh, predicted. It's an event that has extreme impact. Um, we often refer to, um, for example, 9-11 as a, as a black swan, 
but we'll see that there are also positive uh, types of black swans. And it's also um, usually post-rationalized. So what this means is that an explanation seems to usually be found for um, these types of extreme events after the fact, um, by finding the mechanics that led to it. We'll see that in reality, this post-rationalization is sometimes um, <clears throat> just a, a, an attempt to explain why this happened, but we'll also see that there are also so many other ways that even the same event could have happened, that it, uh, it doesn't lead to solutions to prevent certain things from happening. Uh, as I said, it's a, a part of a larger family of extreme events, uh, which is mostly what Dougal is going to refer to uh, later, uh, of other types of extreme events as well. Uh, so I'd like to just give a quick example. This is for those of you who have read The Black Swan by Nassim Taleb, who introduced the, um, the original concept. Um, there's a, a very funny, I think, uh, analogy between the life of a turkey from the perspective of the turkey and extreme events. So if we pretend for a minute that we are a turkey in a farm from the day that we're born, there's this very nice stranger, the farmer, that feeds us, gives us shelter, makes sure that we're healthy. And this is all very good up until Christmas, where suddenly one day all of these assumptions stop. But from the turkey's perspective, this is completely unpredictable because the turkey has only observed that every day she gets fed and um, she gets given shelter and, and protection. And so the moment that the turkey goes to slaughter is, from the turkey's perspective, a black swan. From a different perspective, so the perspective of the farmer, this is not at all a surprise. Right? So I think one of the, one of the um, uh, misconceptions about black swans is that it's uh, something that should be absolutely unpredictable. Uh, whereas in reality, it's also very much a matter of perspective. Um, and extreme events are everywhere. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of natural disasters. We're living through an extreme event right now. Um, we will have a question later whether, whether it is actually um, a, a unpredictable extreme event. Is it a black swan? Is it not? Um, uh, and I think that should spark some interesting discussion. But we've seen extreme events throughout history happen all the time. In fact, most of history is a collection of extreme events. Um, so what does this have to do with projects? Um, and I'm sure that it's not gonna be a surprise, but projects seem to be delayed a lot. Um, so much so that we see it in, uh, in the news uh, a lot of the time. And when large projects go wrong, it has also a large knock-on uh, impact onto um, the rest of society. But if we look at what uh, a project consists of, it consists of lots of different micro activities going on, at, uh, sometimes at the same time, sometimes in sequence. And this is one of the things that we concerned ourselves uh, at M-Plan with. Uh, to try and understand the dynamics uh, that happen within a project from this, uh, from this perspective. And one of the things that we immediately noticed is that most of those activities actually go according to plan, even on projects that go wrong. Um, and the reason I think um, is that the extreme events that happen on activities, which are extremely rare, do have extreme impact on the whole of the project. Um, so this means that we only need a few things to have uh, to, uh, to experience an extreme event within the project to then turn the project into an extreme event itself. Um, and so to illustrate the, the example, we use this slide a lot on, uh, in lots of different contexts, but uh, this is a Gantt chart for a relatively small project. It's what, 100, 120 activities. And um, if we were to imagine a uh, two, uh, two activities going wrong, and we'd have to figure out which two activities it is that could go wrong and what impact would they have. Well, we'd start first by noticing that there's a lot of interconnectivity 
and dependency between these activities. And so it's a very tightly coupled um, network of, uh, of things that are going on. And if one of them then has, especially early on, a knock-on effect on everything else, we'll see that this then um, moves over into having the end of the project, for example, being, uh, being impacted. So what we concern ourselves with is understanding these dynamics and then trying to figure out um, what is the effect of these hidden extreme events. We say hidden because right now we don't, uh, we don't think there's any um, valiant effort in, into measuring and quantifying at that granularity uh, what extreme events could look like. And um, these extreme events, we believe, are hiding everywhere, right? Any of those activities, if you don't know what those activities are, could uh, potentially have uh, an extreme uh, effect. Uh, so that then we can make our plans more resilient. Um, and the resilience to failure is something that um, is starting to come into the collective mind more and more nowadays, especially when we look at um, the, what we're experiencing right now with, uh, with a pandemic uh, how could we have built more resilience into our systems? Uh, and we do this by learning what is the distribution. So what is the aggregate behavior? Uh, and how does this uh, work in regards to the tails of the distribution? So by tails of the distribution, I mean the thin ends at the end of our, um, of our curve, which then if we enter uh, those realities, would have severe, uh, severe effects. Uh, and we do this so that we can predict or project forecasts into the future of, well, if things go mostly according to plan, we know what is going to happen. But what about if some things go wrong and which things have a higher impact than others or would have a higher impact than others if they did go wrong? Um, and the goal is to then measure what is the, what is the impact onto the thing that we care about, which uh, is usually project delivery. And the goal is to create what uh, is then in another Taleb book called anti-fragility. So anti-fragility is um, the ability of a system to react to unexpected change in a positive way. Um, we, so instead of just thinking about re resilience, we're trying to think about, well, how can we then leverage extreme change to make sure that the system actually sometimes accelerates? There may be positive change from disruption. Um, and so this is, this is the ultimate goal for us to, to achieve on projects. I'm going to stop sharing and ask uh, a question for everybody, which I've hinted to earlier which is, do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic is a black swan? And I think I'd like maybe comment, uh, comments also from Dougal and Yao. Um, there's, um, you know, if, uh, if you Google it, there's varying opinions as well. Uh, I know that Taleb himself has a, a certain opinion um, and uh, some of our investors also, uh, have, uh, have their own opinion. And it would just be nice to, to see what everybody thinks. Uh, but maybe, um, Yao, uh, we can start with you. What do you think uh, about Yeah, I wanted to answer your survey, but I can't, uh, panelists aren't allowed to click on, this, on the poll. Um, uh, I don't view it, sorry, I do view it as a black swan event in the sense that, um, and maybe this is a little bit wishful thinking, but I don't think it's gonna happen in this magnitude very often. So the likelihood of occurrence, even though maybe we saw it coming and we knew that it, uh, a lot of folks have warned uh, the world that it might occur, the likelihood and the frequency with which we will see it uh, is rare. And so those tail, in terms of being in the tail of the distribution, if you think about the impact, either from the number of cases or the number of deaths or the economic implications, I think they're all rare um, and they won't occur very often. So I would characterize it as a black swan. Hugo, what about you? Tell him he's unmuted. Hugo, I, I think you're muted. Okay, hi, everybody. 
nice to speak to the world. I see it as part of a conversation, but not the whole conversation. That COVID-19 was well rehearsed in government thinking in terms of a possible future pandemic after the 1918 pandemic. So I think it's a, a, something to talk about, but it's not the real issue, which is how do we consider low probability, high severity events in the context of planning and in the context of operations, which I will speak to when I start my presentation. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's, there's a lot to be said uh, to the fact that there are several reports citing that uh, a global pandemic of some kind was a very high probability and high impact extreme event uh, that could have happened in this decade, let's say. Um, and I think the evidence is scattered, um, which I, the reason why I'm asking this question is mostly because it leads on to a follow-up question, which I think, Yael, you said, absolutely, you think it is a black swan because um, it, it acts as a surprise and it is such a big extreme event, right? It's an extreme event uh, that has an effect on the entire world um, and not, not even just humanity. Um, and, um, my question is, would forecasting it, because in some circles we can see that it's been sort of forecasted that there was this risk, um, but to most of the world, it is still a surprise. So is forecasting and then not taking enough action any different to just not forecasting it? Um, and would, would we still classify that as a black swan if it was forecasted and ignored or forecasted and not enough action taken? Um, and I think it's, it's an open-ended question, but uh, I, I'd like to hear your opinions on it. Looks like we're split. Um, so 57% think it's a yes and a 43% no. Okay. Yeah, I think I think that's in line with sort of what I was uh, what I was expecting, what I was expecting. Uh, and lastly, Alex, before oh sorry, that just to circle back, one uh, when people raise these concerns around, how, we knew that it was highly likely to occur. We didn't anticipate the outcomes. We have to reflect on how we think about black swans and project management because we know they're always going to happen, right? And so we anticipate them often, and they occur around us all the time. And yet people plan and ignore them and people plan and don't actually uh, consider them in their set of possibilities. And so we treat things when they're outside in the world and they're beyond our responsibility as black swans, but when they're in our, uh, you know, or sorry, when, they, when we have the control, we, we call them black swans to eliminate some accountability. When we see them, other people that are accountable, we like to say, those are not black swans, they should have planned. So I also think that there's a perspective thing going on here. Who's, who are we criticizing or who are we holding accountable to what is a black swan and what they should have done uh, to prepare for it? So maybe that will come up later, but. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, th I think you're absolutely right. And uh, as I said before, it's, I think a lot of it depends on the perspective and the angle, right? Uh, so if you're the turkey, then what could you have done as well, right? Um, cool. I wanted to just close the introduction by just saying that, uh, you know, extreme events, we usually link um, in projects with complexity. Uh, the higher the level of complexity of a project, the more likely um, it is that an extreme event on that project will have an extreme effect. Um, because then these complex systems start having um, interactions within themselves and you sort of form positive loops and positive feedbacks and things, and things of this kind. Uh, and we've seen lots of, uh, so even if we exclude the current pandemic, we've seen lots of uh, extreme events and projects that have gone uh, in some cases, well, over budget, over timeline, um, and uh, you know, some are more recent than others. Um, we mentioned a couple in, uh, in one of our original uh, pitches. Uh, you know, there's, there's a little bit of a joke about the Battersea Power Station redevelopment, um, which has gone through lots of different changes for political reasons, but those are all risks, right? It's not just about the structure of the project. Um, and I think complexity 
and uh, impact of extreme events go hand in hand a lot. Um, that said, um, I am going to pass it on to Dougal, who is going to uh, talk to us for a bit from his perspective and his uh, valuable experience on thinking about extreme events. Thank you, Alan. Let me just share my screen. Can you see the screen okay? Hello? No. Uh, we can't see it, Dougal. Okay, we have it. Do you have it? Yeah, we can see it. There we go. Can you still see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to speak from my perspective as a line manager in operations, not as an advisor. But the theme really is hope for the best and plan for the worst. Before I start, I'd just like to pay homage to the many people in this health services who have committed themselves to protecting us from COVID-19. The three messages that currently are in government's mind are stay alert, control the virus and save lives. And I hope we can think of that through this discussion. But I'd rather not focus on black swans, but think more of what Donald Rumsfeld had to say about known knowns. Thinking about unknown unknowns doesn't really help us plan and operate in the future. Now, Dev didn't mention that I have, through part of my career, been heavily involved in polar exploration, both running expeditions, but also as acting director of the British Antarctic Survey. The polar regions are very unforgiving. So if you make a mistake, it can very rapidly lead to a high severity event. The British Antarctic Survey operates two ships in the Antarctic, which are operating in uncharted waters, in difficult ice conditions, in a long way from their logistics hub. So the master of the ship has to juggle many different issues and uh, most of the time things are running smoothly but when things start to go wrong they go quickly badly wrong and one has to be very well prepared for those sorts of circumstances. This is a ship which was lost in the Antarctic. The captain of the ship had trained in the Baltic where the sea ice disappears in the summer. In the Antarctic, the sea ice can be mixed up with glacier ice, and he took the ship through what he thought was first year ice, but there were hard lumps of glacier ice, which led to a small hole in the hull, which he couldn't fill. And because the ship was quite old, the watertight bulkheads weren't secure, and eventually the ship sank. Fortunately, with no loss of life, because the, another tour ship came and picked them up and the weather was sufficiently calm, but they were exposed for five hours in the open lifeboats. When thinking about a firm or a government department, it's set in a system of systems. We can see at the moment we're being impacted by a global phenomenon, but there are markets which are global, such as oil price. There are events in natural catastrophes there are design extremes, operational extremes, and market extremes, which operators have to take account of. So let me just mention a few natural catastrophes. In the UK in 2007, there was very severe flooding. And what we mostly saw in the media were pictures of houses being flooded. But there were two events which brought the government to it concern themselves much more than they had in the past about the protection of electricity substations. If the substation had failed, 500,000 homes would have been threatened. Similarly, there was a water treatment works, which if lost, 350,000 people would be without pipe water. The government, in response to this, created a body called the Centre for the Protection of, Inter of in National Infrastructure to try and bring minds together to think about these low probability, high severity events. In Lloyd's, 
it publishes every year a set of scenarios which are used to stress test all of the underwriting syndicates in the market to see that they can survive a wide range of low probability, high severity events, like a Japanese typhoon or a UK flood. What they didn't anticipate was the COVID-19 impact on business interruption, which is going to cause litigation to go on for a great many years. So one of my poll question was, is how well has your company stress tested the possibility of external events impacting your business? And we'll come to the poll at the end of what I have to say. In design specifications, we're again, not looking at the most likely outcome, but at the extremes. This is a production island in the Canadian Beaufort Sea, which I'll just take the poll off my screen, which was built in the 1980s. And you can see there's a concrete structure in 20 meters of water. The ice load on the structure comes from the ice moving in the springtime, which again is a low probability, high severity event with very little historical data to guide the designers. Sorry, my screen is just frozen. So in the North Sea, the succession of developments over many years, a critical decision is what should be the air gap beneath the platform. And that comes from a combination of low probability, high severity events from the wave climate, storm surge subsidence, or now climate change. The health and safety executive undertook a refresh of the design load from wave height and produced a substantial change in the design condition. So you can see from this picture, there are two platforms on the right-hand side, which are much higher off the water than the facilities built on the left-hand side, because the air gap calculation changed significantly before they were built. There are, of course, from time to time, events which again are high severity, low probability, such as the loss of the Costa Concordia. This was a 1.5 billion US dollar loss in the insurance market. The government puts together a risk register every two years. And in the 2017 risk register, they went to town in describing the potential possibility of a pandemic from influenza, which very much put the issue of COVID-19 COVID the, on the agenda. So the government was prepared for a pandemic and has stockpiled equipment, but you can never anticipate every detail of what would be required. And of course, in markets, there are extremes. The oil price has collapsed, which impacts the share price of BP. But back in the 1970s, the oil price rose very quickly and enabled developments such as Fortis to take place. So you can see there are step jumps in the share price but the key issue is who decides what is acceptable? I believe that companies need to separate the process of deciding what is acceptable from the process of design and development. Senior management needs to be engaged in agreeing what is an acceptable risk. And in triaging those risks, I see four dimensions, human impact, economic impact, but also outrage. There are some things which the general public are much more averse to than others. And there may be the possibility of social and environmental disruption. Estimating the likelihood, what is the return period for an event is very uncertain science. And a lot of scenario planning can develop a detailed scenario, but can't estimate what the likelihood is. Something which I'd like to hear Yale have comments on. So in terms of comparing different scenarios, I think there's a four dimensional framework to be used. So the uh, second poll question was, acceptable risk, does your company have an explicit process for agreeing acceptable risk that was in design and operating phases of a project? Underlying all of this is modeling. In Cambridge, there is a Centre for Risk Studies, which has published many scenarios, including one for an influenza pandemic. In the British Library, there is the Alan Turing Institute, which is sent a national center of research into AI and machine learning, 
and has a consortium of universities and in our expertise. And they're looking hard for good case studies of the application of AI to real world problems. There's also a project called the Oasis Loss Modeling Framework, which is bringing together companies to create an open source modeling framework focused on catastrophe risks. So there are a whole raft of tools for extreme value analysis. But the, uh, fundamentally, one is looking at, will an event occur in a given period? And if it does occur, what is the severity distribution coinciding with that? And as Alan has already remarked, we need to focus on fat tail distributions. Too many engineers have in their mind that everything is a normal distribution. So a three sigma deviation is a very rare event. Whereas with a fat tail distribution, 24 sigma may be possible. So the most common methods look at the tail distribution by analyzing the data above a threshold. But this raises all sorts of issues. Historically, time series are rarely stationary. We may look at the historical data, but we need to weight the older data so it has less influence on the values. And Yale has published some interesting work on this. Often the data is needs cleaning up, and 95% of the work can be sorting out the data. Often there are different drivers to the processes in the tailored distribution, so that multiple distributions and mixtures are required. And correlations may only become apparent when extreme cases occur. So the critical issue is to take account of the potential step jumps that can occur. Machine learning provides powerful analysis tools, but the appropriate split of data to train the model and using data for parameter estimation needs very careful assessment. There are new opportunities which NPLAN is pursuing using big data and computing power. But at the end of the day, we need effective training for analysts and tools using tools for ex including extreme events in models. So let me just say something about communication. I've worked as a line manager running a production on an all-sea platform. I had to make decisions day in, day out, which were binary choices. Analysts can build a model and often are not involved in actually making decisions. They'll give expert advice, but we have to recognize the manager is making choices. And the culture, which again, Yale, I'm sure she'll have some comments on, is that the decision makers often operate from an emotional perspective, while the analyst is building another model. And there may be a divide between the analysts and the decision makers, which we need to work hard to bridge. In government, ministers are bombarded with information from a very wide range of sources. The prime minister constantly repeats the phrase that the decisions are based on science advice, but the science advice may not be clear. There may be disagreement in the science community, and there may be many other people who have the ear of the minister. Similarly, in a company, the chief executive may have science advisors, but it's bombarded with information from a very wide range of sources. So ultimately, there needs to be a formal process for testing resilience to extreme events. We can take the historical data and build a model with the Poisson process or a viral distribution. But in parallel to that, there needs to be some sort of process to identify low probability, high severity scenarios and represent them in models. But management needs to respond to this and may, for example, argue that the risk is unacceptable and therefore change the system. So there's a feedback loop required. So in summary, in thinking through the response to a set of low probability, high severity scenarios is an essential best practice for governments and companies. Quantitative risk models are only a guide to decisions and not making the decisions. Communications of the uncertainty of the estimates is not straightforward. The analyst and the decision maker need to work hard to understand each other. Decision paths and accountability need to be crystal clear. Over time, the paths may become more and more complex and need regular review. So my poll questions were, have you read the government's National Risk Register report? Are you aware of the existence of the Center for the Protection of National Infrastructure and National Cybersecurity, which provides valuable advice to companies and local authorities about preparing for low probability high severity events? And does your organization use extreme value analysis for developing scenarios for high severity, low likelihood events? 
I hope that gives you a feel from where I'm coming from. And perhaps we can turn to Yale for a response to what I've just said. Perhaps we can, uh, Dougal, we could just pick up quickly. There's, uh, we've already got a lot of results back and it's a, it's a split at the moment on your last question about uh, does your organisation use extreme value analysis? So given uh, around half don't, maybe you could talk a little bit about the practice of that because I think it's a really important point what you said about um, the analysis uh, and being somewhat scientific and then the decision makers who have to end up making some kind of binary decision. So if you could talk through maybe how you take that science and then go towards making the best decision that you can. Sure, I'm just gonna see whether I can see the questions. And of course, Yael, if you'd like to weigh in on that too, we'd love to hear your, your right. thoughts and, and any other techniques as well. Sure, and uh, I think if you press on polls, uh, Dougal, you can see the, the results of your poll, your poll questions, which, Basically, I mean, these results are shocking, right? Stat, I mean, folks who joined this webinar, folks that are that care about the topic, they uh, maybe are in uh, related to project management fields. Uh, you would expect there to be more awareness around these kind of uh, organizations and these capabilities, and uh, for organizations to be more mature at this point in time in using some of these techniques. And I think going back to this great, uh, excellent, really uh, set of uh, slides from Dougal, this idea of correlations and linking your modeling and your efforts to managerial decision making is really important and it goes all the way back to even data collection part of the problem is that organizations and nplan knows this all too well right because they're trying to use data in a smart way to overcome certain blind spots that we may have when we think of theoretical distributions people think as you pointed out in gaussian uh ways people don't think about uh fat tails because they don't look at actual data sometimes that would tell them that they have to widen their their range but the data to begin with is flawed and so this whole effort around collecting data in a smart way that will then support decision making is only something that we're now uh, being more proactive about. And so if you go into a random company today and you try to implement some tools, you will find that your main uh, hurdle is looking at data. Where does the data come from? And there's been a lot of reactions in the COVID that models alone are not gonna help us understand how to plan. We need data to combine with models to move forward. And I think that this is, uh, in the world of projects, that this is exactly part of the hurdle that we face, is that not enough companies are thoughtful in their data collection, their data uh, manipulation, and uh, then analyzing and looking at the data to coincide with their planning. If this became more of a second nature, we would pick up on correlations, we would be more prepared, and we would be more thoughtful in how we think about uh, uh, risks of the future. So that's my initial reaction, and I'll let Dougal respond. Sure, sure, I'd like to respond to that. In particular, is how do we communicate uncertainty? In measuring data, in measurement devices, there's always uncertainty, and yet people can take it as black and white, that the data is pure in some way not recognizing that, for example, in postcode information for crimes, the police station postcode was entered into the database because people didn't know what the database, the code was for the crime. <laughs> so when they came to analyze the spatial distribution of crime, it all seemed to concentrate on police stations. Now that's a trivial example, but demonstrates the difficulty that we have in communicating uncertainty. That's why I said that data cleanup can take up 80% of the time of a project before you even begin to fit a model. There's also a tendency to use the models that are available. What does Excel have, which you can use, rather than going to R, which has a much more powerful kit of tools, but many analysts only ever use Excel. Thank you. I think that was uh, that was very valuable. I, we also have a question from the audience that's been sitting there for a while. Uh, I thought I'd bring it up because it, it, it also fits with the conversation that we're having, uh, which is from a night and risk perspective. So this is from Neil Thompson. Can we only deal with risk and are we still at the mercy of uncertainty or uh, so risk being something that we can apply a p-value to and uncertainty being something that we cannot apply a p-value to. Alan, um, let me just jump in there. Uh, we do have a range of uh, people in the audience today 
many of whom won't be familiar with NITE and risk perspectives and p-values, um, including myself. So if you wouldn't mind just giving us a quick briefing on what those things mean uh, before diving into the response, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, so I'm not an expert about NITE and risk, but um, it's the, the principle of NITE and uncertainty is that it's an unquantifiable, uh, unquantifiable risk. So it's something that we cannot know um, <clears throat> the probability of, uh, and this is something that comes from economics, if I'm not wrong, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it's uh, it's also a concept about trying to distinguish risk and uncertainty, and I think that there are some parallels um, between nighty and uncertainty and. Um, the combination of epistemic and aleatoric uncertainty. Um, so the, in, in, in the case of extreme events, what I would consider nighty and uncertainty would be um, the unmeasurable probability of things that we have never observed before. So, um, and this, this is something that um, is very hard to even just think about, but it's something that having never happened before, it's very difficult to make any projections about. Um, and so from this perspective, are we, uh, the question I think was, are we just at the mercy of any of this happening? And I think, um, I, I'll, I'll start with my opinion and then Yal and, and Dougal, I'd love to hear yours. But from my perspective, there is a process by which we can convert Knightian uncertainty into measured uncertainty. Uh, and so I think the two, the two quantities are not always separate and, um, and not convertible. But, uh, and this is one of the things that we uh, are, are worried with effectively, um, if you think of it from a different perspective, is taking what is, uh, as Dougal calls it, the unknown unknowns, and see if uh, from as much data as possible, can we then create a measurement for these things? Um, and I think there is a process of transferring as much as that weight of risk, let's say, uh, because, and because it's not measurable, you can't really quantify it. But in a, in a um, um, subjective way, you can say that there is more transfer from nineteen uncertainty to aleatoric uncertainty, for example. Um, so that, that's my opinion. And I think that's, that's where forecasting plays a big role. Yeah, for forecasting, but also I would add that clever project, uh, just to kind of narrow the conversation a little bit tact, uh, uh, in a tactical way to projects, there are ways to plan your projects to discover those unknown unknowns. And so uh, there's, there's a book called Managing the Unknown. Uh, Christoph Loch, who's the uh, dean at Cambridge Business School, a judge, uh, he does a lot in this area. And one of the things that they point out there is that when you, in order to discover unknown unknowns, you need to plan your project differently. You have to explore in parallel. You have to explore uh, uh, in, in very quick bursts. You have to work in a different way versus some other methods that you would use when you have more known unknowns or when risks that you can actually anticipate. And so depending on complexities of the projects and other characteristics, you would think about your your Gantt chart, and I'm not going to go all the way to, to Agile and think about the benefits of that, but you would plan out your project differently to unravel, uncover those. And so you can be proactive to say, there is things out there I don't know. In order to discover them, I need to take action. I need to take action that I wasn't thinking of taking yesterday, and, I did, and I've never taken before. So if I can think out of the box, then I will get to a place that I will discover what might happen. And so you need to be proactive. I mean, there are ways to be a little bit more proactive uh, to, to uncover some of those. So that would be just my, my insight on that. You have to be fleet of foot. In, on my screen, I have referenced the Radical Uncertainty book that Mervyn King and John Kay have just published. It's a fascinating read on this subject. Uh, yeah, if I could just uh, ask you to expand a little bit on that point, I thought that was super interesting, uh, the, the tactical perspective. Um, I work a lot with our clients and our prospective clients, and, and often the response is, well, are you telling us about this, uh, this tail, potential tail event? Um, what, what can we actually do it about? What can we do about it? We can't just increase the duration of our projects. Um, so 
is that what we need to do? Do we need to increase the duration of our projects? And then maybe how do you trade off between setting ambitious targets for uh, for teams, you know, from a client perspective? Um, yeah, can you can you unpack that a little bit? Of course, I think that's a great question because we don't always want to plan for that extreme because it makes planning very challenging and that's not going to always be the solution, right? Because we work in a very competitive uh, resource constrained world. Um, but you can, if you think about those tail events, if you think about those big delays, if you think about those uh, from your company's perspective, potential catastrophic outcomes, maybe you want to be more thoughtful about what indicators along the way will you be observing, anticipating something is coming heading that way, right? Like um, uh, one of the colleagues in my area, a researcher from Georgetown, uh, uh, Robin Dylan Merrill, she talks about near disasters, like near events. Uh, we often think about, um, we see the warnings, we think something's going to go wrong, but then it didn't. And we think, oh, we're great. We're professionals. We take credit for why we stopped it from happening. And we give it ourselves that boost of credibility as if we have the power to always prevent it. We don't always acknowledge that it was luck or good luck on our side. If we think about those near events and think about what were the signs that something was about to happen, that we could have taken action to protect ourselves and we either did or didn't, then we can start uh, having more of a backup plan. You know, okay, so we see that China's shutting down. What kind of actions do we take then and there to prevent it from escalating uh, out of control? And so I think it's a, a lot about having these backup plans, having this, uh, uh, this thoughtful action oriented uh, uh, guidelines along the way, red flags along the way that we're not just ignoring, but we're proactively challenging and building up all the time. Uh, that, that would be the starting point, but there's so much more that we can talk about that I think uh, uh, is important around that, that companies don't take enough proactive action around, right? They say, yes, this is a tail, a low chance of happening, but there is a lot of things that they can do to prepare themselves along the way. Does that answer your question, Toby? Yeah, I think that, that's really, there's so much I want to talk about in this. So that almost is like a uh, kind of moving away from the w waterfall, uh, kind of the traditional Gantt chart, almost to an agile methodology. Do you see, uh, do, do, do any of the people you speak to, do they talk about using agile techniques as a project management technique in the delivery of projects or are they using kind of more waterfall Gantt chart style, but then just doing this kind of scenario analysis on the side? Because I think it is, it is always challenging when you think about trying to deliver a construction project with all of the kind of specifics that there are in the construction industry, like long lead times, designs that are locked in and all these kind of things. And that, like the, the prospect of agile is just like, seems a bit too hard. Right. Um, so, right. so yeah, do you, do you actually see people doing this and how, how are they going about that? I, I think that there's a reason why, um, and I'm happy to, to open it up to others' perspective, but I think that there's a reason why we see the move to Agile so uh, strong and powerful over the past 20 years or so, because it, risk planning and risk management and risk registrars and impacts and likelihood matrices, all of those great tools have had limited success in practice because it just doesn't, ha just it hasn't solved our problems, right? And yet Agile seems to have hit a sweet spot. It seems to deliver results, right? Companies are, are flo flocking to it because they see that there is some improved capability in uh, uh, spontaneous and more uh, um, agile reaction, less rigid systems, a little bit more flexibility there, and they feel that the pivoting is easier, right? Uh, where a lot of things are coming to an end today from an operations perspective is we're here, we're seeing, you know, fixed infrastructure and very non-rigid operations struggle to adapt. It's the companies that have a lot more flexibilities that are going to survive this this uh, uh, pandemic, which is why higher education, sadly, is not because we're very uh, uh, fixed in our resources and in our structures. But um, so agile is there for a reason. Now, is it a tr direct translation agile in the world of software to agile in construction? Of course not, right? To your point, you can't be totally uh, uh, goal. You can't change the goalpost all the time when you're building a building, right? Or when you're building a, a construction. So you do need to develop 
your vision of what agile implies, okay? Flexible workforce, flexible uh, materials, uh, flexible supply chain, flexible scheduling, uh, uh, different ways to tackle certain problems from, from how you originally thought about it. Two teams in parallel working to build or to solve a problem as opposed to one team working very sequentially. Like there are ways to adopt more of an agile mindset, even if it's not to the T executing on every part with a one, one week sprint like you know Salesforce does, right? So it, it does require some imagination, but uh, the mentality is a good shift because it opens the door to a lot more flexibility um, and less rigidness. Uh, from the system. Okay, could I add to that, please? please yeah. Yeah, so I've always believed in process auditing, where, where you want to ensure that things don't happen. You can't count them because they didn't happen. All you can do is audit the system and ensure that the processes that exist in the company are effectively working. And that underpins management of projects because there may be an interface failure or a process failure which is not allowing the information to get through. So managers can't manage. Yeah. Um, I, um, we're, we're sort of naturally entering Q and A anyway. Um, so I, I wanted to ask uh, Yael, I know we spoke about this a couple of days ago, but um, around what sort of actions can we take on uh, as a reaction to uh, forecasted risk? I, I hinted earlier that not forecasting risk and forecasting it and not doing anything would be virtually the same thing. Um, and do you think, uh, you know, if we, if we get a forecast for risk, what, what sort of actions can we be taking? And flexibility in the plan, I think, is uh, is great, and uh, and it requires a whole cultural shift. But there may be something that, even if we keep plans as they are, there's something that might be lower hanging fruit or things that we can we can do at a call it just preparation level. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll first go with like the obvious, uh, you know, use end plans uh, technology. Uh, you know, something. Uh, we are moving to a world where our capabilities around prediction are improved, okay? Uh, and, and that's true for, for almost every area in our life. Project planning is not one that we've adopted it or implemented it to, to that level of professionalism that we see in, in um, elsewhere, right? So um, big data, machine learning uh, tools that will allow us to open our minds to, to predictions and generate predictions in multiple ways very fast. Uh, we don't have to use theoretical uh, 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 distributions anymore, but we can use uh, non-parametric uh, uh, type of models, learning from data to, to move forward. I think that that's a first step, okay? To do that and proactively seek more sophisticated tools because let's face it, Monte Carlo has not cut it. And you guys both know that I'm a big fan of Monte Carlo, but like it hasn't worked in practice. It hasn't solved everybody's problem. We need to add rigor and sophistication to that. So we need our decision makers, those who are going to make a binary choice. We need them to trust the models and believe the models and understand what those models are telling us. And so uh, I, I think, Dougal, you mentioned this idea of communicating uncertainty and risk, right? Um, I, I'm working now on a paper. Think about all the ways in which uncertainty and risk has been communicated during the COVID uh, crisis. It's unbelievably uh, confusing uh, to, to the layperson, and it's uh, it's not something that is totally explained. They show you, you know, bands of like shaded areas on charts, it's assuming people understand what those imply or mean. Some people use 50 percentiles, but some people use 99 percent. It's, it's just inconsistency and a little bit of a wild west. And so better habits, better discussion, uh, training folks, obviously, and keeping track. Like, you know, uh, one of my co-authors, who's a, a very big name in the world of forecasting, Bob Winkler, he worked historically with uh, weather forecasters. And the reason that they, I know that we don't like to trust weather forecasters and maybe anywhere else, in, but the UK, we can kind of trust them a little bit more. But, um, you know, the reason that they got better over time and weather forecasters are actually pretty good at what they do is because they keep track and they score it. Like they look at the performance and they care and they then improve their predictions. We don't do that in project planning, right? Like nobody says, oh, look at your predictions. You were off, you've improved or look at this individual at that department. They're the best forecaster in the organization. Like we don't do that, right? 
Um, so I think that there are little things like that from a cultural perspective almost that we can bring to the table that will change the conversation and improve the way that we think about it. Uh, so that would be just some of my uh, responses to your question. That's excellent. Um, there, there's, a, there's a question or kind of a, a comment, I guess, on, on one of the previous ones about flexibility and um, practicing, I guess, uh, yeah, providing flexibility in, in the workforce and other, other departments um, at, from our friend Harvey Haney from uh, ExxonMobil. Um, and he said, in order to have that flexibility, you also need to understand the increased cost that is a result of flexibility. So it's a combination. So I wonder if you, either, either of you could pick that up. I mean, my first, uh, thought about that is we incur a lot of costs uh, as a result of delayed projects. So, you know, is, I guess is the, the risk of the cost of delayed projects greater than the risk of, risk of uh, or the, the certainty of the flexibility that you pay for? Yeah, um, and I'm happy to have uh, Dugo chime in. I mean, we all pay for insurance, right? Uh, so it's worthwhile in the long run because we're willing to pay a little bit every time and then to avoid the big disasters. I think this is the same. Yes, we're gonna require some investment. We're gonna require some resources to build in the flexibility. We're gonna require some uh, investment on behalf of companies to build that resilience. But if we have it, then it will pay off when we need it, right? Uh, I think sadly, a lot of us wish that uh, a lot more of that was done upfront versus this day and age when we're now stuck with the aftermath of, of lack of capabilities or flexibilities uh, that for instance, hospitals have, right? Like, if we had more flexibility built in, then maybe we would uh, save some lives now. Um, so I think it's definitely worth the investment, but indeed you have to think about it long term and not just uh, short term. Uh, Dougal, there's another question that's just come in from Q&A uh, around kind of in the government space, so maybe one for you. Um, in, the question is from Deepak Anand. Um, in government infrastructure projects, should the government consider these black swan events to forecast the probable future costs and analyze the bids to reduce the risk of claims from the contractor? What, what I believe government should do is be much more concerned with getting the same requirements right at the beginning and not entering the project without having done at least the preliminary design. It commits too early to a project where it needs to learn in the first part of the project where the complexity is and where the uncertainty exists and that's not always clear so yes so the government can do it in the way in which it manages projects but it, too often it for example the ship i showed at the beginning of my presentation hmm. was funded by the government at a fixed price and the yard thought that they would make the profit on the change orders but there were no change orders the ship design was de-scoped to fit inside the budget. And eventually the shipyard went out of business. It was their last project. Uh, I, I used to work for a contractor. And I know there's plenty of contractors out there who, uh, who, uh, whose business model relies on that, that kind of thing. So um, maybe, maybe requires a rethink in the way that we, uh, that we contract. And I, I guess what you're thinking, what you mentioned is, early engagement, two-stage contracts, uh, two, uh, yeah, yeah so when I moved from BP to the British Antarctic Survey, in BP there was a very rigorous cost estimating process. You couldn't go to the board unless you'd narrowed the cost estimates to within a agreed window. In BAS, they did back of the envelope calculations with no in-depth work because they hadn't got the funding for it and they were then bid for, for example, for a new ship, based on very limited work in terms of the detail ahead of the bid. And I think that's true across government, that there's insufficient attention paid to what the detailed design is before you do the cost estimate, or a measure of the detailed design. Getting that balance right is crucial. Absolutely. I'm just looking through um, some other questions here. If there's other, if there's other questions, please do submit them. Um, people are putting them into the chat and also the Q and A. Either one is fine. Yeah, there's uh, a there's a follow up. Uh, says Dougal, doesn't this mean that we'll have a lot of started and aborted projects? Sure. Some projects shouldn't proceed because the original cost estimate may have been far too optimistic. So, I yes, totally agree. Totally agree. <laughs> Uh, 
there's a question here from Antonio. Uh, uh, yeah, the question is, one of the biggest challenges in business is to be able to justify all the effort of analysis with the possible quantifiable benefit. Furthermore, even senior management does not always believe what we do on purpose or by convenience. ROI for them is very low since risk and uncertainty management based on historical or cont contemporaneous data is seen as a big black box. Is further education the answer to that? I think that speaks to my point about the decision maker operating from an emotional perspective and the analysts doing quantitative modeling and there being a gap between the two. Mm. So is that on analysts to uh, better be able to appeal to the emotions of managers or is it on managers to better understand the analysis? It needs moves on both sides, but if that gap is not recognized, the analysts will write the 100 page report with the recommendations on the last page and <laughs> surprised when the minister doesn't say, oh yes, that's great. <laughs> so bridging that gap is comes in all sorts of ways it's not just in the way you prepare the report is do you have the three messages clearly articulated on page one mm -hmm. and, yeah i totally agree i think it's everybody's response it's both sides responsibility to understand their uh, blind spot and to understand why they're not communicating well uh, one very famous case study that we teach often uh, is about um, the challenger and about the lack of the the disaster occurred because the analysts who had some insight as to what might happen did not communicate their results and of course the senior uh, leaders were not open to reacting to anything that they were hearing and so it's everybody's responsibility it's their joint responsibility um, and we need to recognize where it is that we fall short um, so I definitely think that it's about a conversation and it's about uh, finding those people who are good at it. Um, even think about when you draft an email. We typically go on and on and on and our ask is the last sentence before, before we say goodbye. Put your ask up front. Like that's the first thing yeah. you should say so people know, right? Nobody writes their emails that way. It's like aside writing from, a Aside from my husband, but it drives me nuts. <laughs> yeah, it's like being, writing for a newspaper. You've got to get it in the first paragraph to capture the attention. It's a long way to go. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a big challenge that uh, we're working on at MPlan. Um, and in fact, we have a new colleague who's on the line today who's uh, done a lot of work in uh, in the risk space, and that's the expertise she brings to our team. So we're looking forward to getting her out there. You um, need, need to have a range of specialities, particularly psychologists, and looking on the softer side of the equation rather than the engineering side. I think that's the danger of it engineering company is that they don't have enough artists and poetry writers yeah actually there's there's one final part in that in that last question from antonio um the, about black box and uh we are in, in in an industry uh where many of the people involved in decision making are engineers and they want to understand the mechanics of how things work and the reality of some of these models is that we can't explain them or they can't be explained unless they go and spend five years in a uh, doing a phd and i think there's similar applications in uh you know in like the COVID model and with climate models and other things where the general public is also consuming i guess the outputs of this so i wonder uh what you think about that and and how we kind of uh how we get over the the concern about the black box and not understanding the mechanics of it and instead um, being, and then discounting the results, maybe. Maybe there's a lesson in the weather weather people. I don't know. Sure, in, in the Oasis project that I referred to, where there's a consortium of companies building an open source model, they're doing that so that there's more transparency, so you can understand better what the model is doing. But there's a danger with machine learning that it, you, you get the results, you don't really understand what is happening in the guts of the modeling system. And it, you, you put the data in, you get the output, but do you really understand what's happening? Uh, the Turing Institute is grappling with that problem. The field of interpretable machine learning is pretty hot these days. So there are a bunch of researchers who are focused on trying to do that, to try and make it more accessible. Um, 
you know, I teach data science at the business school. And so uh, folks always say, oh, the MBAs, you know, they don't need to know how these things work. They don't even know how, need to know how to run the numbers. They just need to look at the outputs. It's like, well, you can't really do that. We all know that that's not the way it works. You don't understand the output if you don't understand what had to go into the input, mm -hmm. right? So like, I'm a strong believer in educating folks and, and actually pushing their understanding too. So yes, it's a black box, but there are ways to build intuition. There are ways to make it more accessible. It's the responsibility from the machine learning community, but it's also the responsibility from the business world to, again, uh, nothing is just one-sided, but to practice and improve the way that we do things, right? So start by offering data science courses to, to managers and you stand a chance to get somewhere. If you don't even offer them the material, they'll never learn, obviously, right? And so uh, uh, start by offering it, making it more welcoming, explaining the appeal, showing, empowering them to have conversations with their analysts in the companies, uh, empowering them to be respectful of the work that the analysts do uh, so they don't uh, dismiss it, but they know how to have that dialogue. And that's what I try to do with my students. But um, I think that there, there is a way to overcome some of that black box, black box niche of it. Um, even if the algorithms are sophisticated, we can find ways to do that, right? Yeah. Anybody who's read Elements of Statistical Learning knows that there are better ways to describe machine learning models, right? Um, at, at one point that I want you to clearly come across in my talk was the question of, who is accountable for deciding what is exceptional and what is unacceptable mm. and divorcing that from the modeler and the analyst because senior management has a responsibility to make that choice. Now, often that choice is embedded in a standard or a code. There is a standard for North Sea platforms, which has a piece about what the air gap should be and the one in a hundred year return figure. But companies building platforms need to explicitly adopt that measure and not have it embedded in the project so that senior management can't see it. But there's a wonderful report on the loss of a Nimrod aircraft over Afghanistan, written by a judge whose name escapes me, in which he delved into the decision making within the Ministry of Defence, where it wasn't clear at all who was accountable for what. Haddon Cave was the name of the judge. Charles Haddon Cave. Um, so we have the, oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Go, go now. Uh, yeah, just to jump in, we have. Uh, I just wanted to read. There's a there's a comment that's been here for a little bit from the Q and A, which says, "Spot on, Yao. As an analyst, I may be sharing bad news, and management might not want to hear it. The more I challenge and push the bad news as a realistic outcome, the more likely management are to get annoyed about it. So much seems emotional and psychological. Dougal is right. Emotional intelligence and facts and data are a rare combo, but essential to success. So I just wanted to read that out as a, as a point from the audience that um, it, is, uh, it is very valid. And then we have a bunch of questions. Um, which like, one, uh, one that I can definitely take, which is how to predict black swans at an early stage of a project when we prepare the detailed schedules and provide certain contingencies against known and predictable risks. Do Mplan have a tool to predict such black swans at an early stage of the project? And um, in reality, like, if we think specifically about black swans and extreme events, predicting the specific event, so I don't know, a generator is going to explode, um, that is virtually impossible. But what, what we do is we collect outcomes. And so we make outcome-based forecasts and we make them in a probabilistic way. So certain um, categories will have um, a higher likelihood or a different shape of tails. And we use that as the observed outcomes. And we do this by collecting um, a large number uh, of, uh, of completed schedules as well. Um, so I think at the last count, our, our data set contained roughly $800 billion of completed projects. Um, and so we use that information to say, well, this is, uh, looks more like the type of activity or the type of project that will have this type of tail, um, which makes it outcome-based uh, rather than causality-based. So we wouldn't be able to say the generator is going to explode, but we might be able to say 
while when installing generators, and I don't know why I'm talking about generators now, but when installing generators, there has been, or substations is more likely, when installing substations, there has been a tale of extreme events. Uh, and that's where we think um, it starts becoming um, an input to what could be flexible planning, which is what Yal was talking about earlier, right? Because if you know these outcomes could happen, then you can include flexibility in, uh, even if you are, you are doing things in a waterfall way, you can start including conditions, for example. And I know Dougal, uh, you, we, you and I have spoken before about conditional planning and, uh, and having uh, probabilistic planning as, uh, as a thing. Um, yeah, and then there's, um, I guess, a question for, um, I, for all of I, us. Before you move on to the next question, can I ask you one? Can yeah. I uh, add one comment? I feel like yeah. I want to stress a, a technical kind of nerdy detail, but, uh, I, and Dougal made this in his talk, but this notion of correlations is really important. We so rarely mod model correlations. There's so many models that we use that we forget to remember that they build on independence, that it really is part of the problem. Like if we build in independence to our model, we're not gonna see those tails accurately reflected. It's the correlation yeah. of all these rare events that uh, really uh, uh, comes back to bite us. That's true for the 2008 crisis, that's true for today, that's true, true for many different projects. And like my students always used to laugh at me that when even a simple Monte Carlo ex uh, exercise, I always have the class where I say, okay, now the weather is affecting all these tasks. How do you model it? And like have them be creative around correlations. But if you don't think, stop to think about it, you ignore it and you don't realize that when thing goes wrong, everything goes wrong or a lot of things go wrong. And that can have really dire consequences. The only times it doesn't, if, if everything is perfectly independent, which is not the case in most of the projects and the settings that we're talking about. And so it's really important to kind of bring that correlation discussion uh, front and center and to, to think about ways to incorporate it into our models. And again, machine learning doesn't solve the problem is you need those correlation between the different tasks, between the durations, between the costs, between everything else that's going on. So that's all I want. Absolutely. To yeah, Great and comment. you've nailed on the head one of the things that we've tried to to, to, to solve um, for a very long time. And we've worked very hard on like, what is the correlation between activities uh, specifically on a project? Um, Alan, there's, Alan, there's two questions there that are kind of related. So um, you've talked about using big data to highlight risks. What about novel projects for which there is no historical data? And the next one's kind of related because it's about, it asks about um, uh, intergenerational risks. So I guess things that have, not been seen before by the model, and maybe that's because they haven't happened in our generation, you know, something like COVID. So how, how, how do you think about that in terms of the modeling? Yeah, and uh, so I'll start with the first one, which is uh, what about projects for which there is no historical data? So the approach that we've taken is that such a project doesn't really exist unless you're talking about building a power station on Mars. Um, and what I mean is that like, and I hear this a lot, that every project is different. Uh, but in reality, projects are made up of components that in some way or another have been done before. Um, maybe not in exactly the same sequence, maybe not in the same place, right? So there will be differences, but um, there will be also be a lot of similarities. So we try and leverage as many of those similarities as possible. Um, and that's where uh, our models learn um, patterns, right? Um, and so, uh, for example, I might know that um, a first coat of paint comes uh, after plastering. Um, and that is true of the walls of a house that I might be building, but it might also be true of what's happening when we build a hospital. And, uh, and I think those, kind, those are the kinds of patterns that we strive to get our models to learn. Um, the, uh, the second question, so there is no historical data. We think there is historical data. It will be more uh, uncertain. It will be less granular. It will be less, less correlated, but there will be some, right? Uh, and so what, what our models reflect is where when there's a new project that um, is 
very different and not very similar to the things that the model has seen before, we'll see the model express more of what we call epistemic uncertainty, uh, which means um, that it will, it will give wider ranges of probability. Um, Could I comment on that, please? Sure. New technology and new materials haven't been observed before. So you have to work much harder to build a detailed model of what might happen. In the insurance world, cyber risk is moving rapidly up the agenda, but there's no historical data to speak of. It's very non-stationary, so that in pricing of a cyber risk contract, you have to build a much more sophisticated model than you might otherwise do if you had a lot of historical data. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so one of, the, one of the patterns in that case for us would be that we would start with high um, epistemic uncertainty. And then as more and more of those techniques are seen, the model will automatically reduce its, uh, its uncertainty estimates. Um, so, um, sorry, Toby, what was... Sorry? Cladding on buildings is an example of how technology can go wrong. Yes, absolutely. Um, Toby, there was another question that I think we've lost. So uh, there's one there. And we've got about we've got just under 10 minutes to go. So maybe we'll take the last couple of questions and then, and then wrap mm. up. Um, but there's one in there, um, I, I guess a general one about black swans. Uh, so for black swan events, why is post-rationalization with hindsight so common? Are we obsessed with control? Love that question. That's good. <laughs> I think that's a yes, but short answer, by the way. But well, I think answer. that I think that we're only human, and we like to try and explain what we can, right? Um, and we like to feel that we're in control. It's very hard to to let go of that sense. So, uh, not to get too philosophical, but like you know, look at what's going on now. How many? conspiracy theories have been surfacing around what's going on, that this was all the planned and, and, and deliberate and, you know, pointing fingers. Uh, that's part of it because we, we want to feel some sense of control or we want to know that somebody controlled it, that it's not totally out of our control, right? Um, so I, I don't totally see that that's a yes. But hindsight is a Yeah, problem. I agree. Yeah. I, 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 I agree, There's yeah. actually a point that links to something that we spoke about earlier, which is, uh, Post-rationalization is, uh, with hindsight, yes, is common. But uh, the other point that Yael mentioned earlier is, is measurement. Um, and post-rationalization is, is, can be argued as, as some source of measurement now, that we are, that something has happened and, and now we're say, trying to figure out why it happened. Um, and if you take that example that Yael mentioned, and I, and I really think there's like a big point to drive home here, um, is uh, the weathermen have become effective forecasters and reliable forecasters of their project, which is the weather, um, by, by learning, right? They, they make a forecast and they check, did I get my forecast right or wrong? Uh, we do projects and, um, you know, I, I know there's, there's um, armies of uh, individuals that, that come together to try and uh, determine the lessons learned from a project. Uh, this is far from what we call, uh, what the weathermen would call uh, measuring and learning. Uh, the cycle time between uh, an assumption, reality, and the correction of the new assumption is, is, is often far too long uh, to be able to take meaningful action. And so shortening that cycle, so it's like, uh, I made a plan to do this, that plan has failed, uh, I'm capturing the data, and that data is going to help my organization or wider than my organization um, learn from a failure or an accuracy of, of a forecast. And increasing that cycle um, or reducing that cycle time, but increasing the frequency of it is, is perhaps a, a really critical key to unlock in all of this. And why would you do that? Well, <laughs> so that you can get better at all of this, right? Which is the topic of this entire, uh, what, what we've spent an hour and a half talking about so far.
think we're I think we're pretty much out of questions unless someone wants to drop one in. This has been absolutely fascinating, and I think for me anyway, maybe I'm a project geek, but um, we we've only had a handful of people drop out of the webinar, and uh, I saw Neil drop the message saying he's putting his kids to bed. So um, we have gone on uh, for an hour and a half. Uh, I guess any any final statements, uh, any comments? You know, what what do we need to what, what are the key things that we need to take away? Uh, from this session when, when thinking about uh, uh, black swan or, or uh, extreme events? Maybe a comment from each of the panelists. So should sure. I go first? Um, oh, okay. Um, so in my mind, uh, the, the, the big point uh, I think about today is that um, the step one is that we need to acknowledge the existence of extreme events and the fact that they could be hidden anywhere and they are very frequent, uh, despite each individual one being very rare. Um, and so that step one is just measuring, measuring, then forecasting, and then acting. And I think those three steps come one after the other. Uh, and so the sooner we get to accurately measuring, the sooner we can get to the other steps and, and start seeing uh, resilience and eventually even, uh, even anti-fragility. Um, so I think this is the beginning of the conversation. It's definitely not the end, despite being the, the end of the webinar. Uh, I, I'd like this to be the, the beginning of a much longer conversation that goes on. And that's, that's nicely timed, Ellen, because I've just launched the poll. So if you would like to be part of that discussion, uh, please click yes there. We'll, uh, all of the other polls have been anonymous, uh, but this one will have your details and we'll include you in that ongoing discussion. Uh, I'll add to, to Alan uh, and say, uh, remember to be kind of forgiving to yourself, meaning probabilistic. When you work with probabilities and you get used to thinking about tail events and when you work with the world of distributions, uh, uh, it's not as easy to be thoughtful of what the how the outcome matches your model right like uh election predictions and and other events people are very quick to dismiss things and say oh we were wrong the model isn't good we didn't perform well it does take perfect uh time and it does take some persistence even in how you're judging your own capabilities and your growth right and so just be a little bit uh, uh mature around those reactions and believe in in your efforts over time they will prove to be useful uh it's not that from today till tomorrow everything is going to end up in a line as you planned it to be so uh that would be just my word of caution okay uh, thanks very much for the invitation to participate in this fascinating discussion i'll draw on some of the experience in safety the international safety rating system was developed by a group of people who set out what an ideal company would do, what the perfect company would do, and then benchmarked against that ideal plan. And I think you could develop an audit scheme which focuses on the processes embedded in the planning, which you believe a perfect company would do, and then compare that to the actual company's performance and see where things need to be improved. Rather than a compliance audit, a process audit helps you to see where to put resources to improve the process rather than saying you, you didn't comply. I like it. That's, uh, we've, got, we've got one practical element uh, appealing to the rational and the scientists and one emotional element, you know, uh, don't, you know, this is, these are hard problems. Uh, I, I think that it's, uh, it's a really nice way to finish the session. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for, for attending. Uh, I, think I think we just good. got, we, we have one, one, one last one oh, that one. just came in from the audience. So, uh, uh, Professor Ian Reeves. Oh, cool. Can we unmute him or is he? Uh, Am I unmuted? We can yeah, hear you. We yes. hear you. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say that uh, from this discussion, I think a powerful thing to take away is not so much only the ability to anticipate and foresee these extreme events, but how we react quickly to them and the ability to be very decisive in decision-making in response. Uh, often 
we, uh, we, we could do better in anticipating them. But my experience in major projects is that we're all too often bad at making uh, thorough and decisive decisions at the time. And I, I think Professor Yar really drew on this point. So I think agility in anticipating them and being better at managing is my takeaway. Very true. Thank you, Ian, for sharing that. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll, I'll close the session uh, on time. Um, thank you for everyone that joined us. We had over 100 people uh, join this uh, webinar, which is fabulous, uh, given that it was our first time doing it. Uh, I'm also thankful that none of the IT failed us at any point. Um, so that's a big sigh of relief. Um, if you would like to continue the discussion um, with us, you know, hit that yes button on the poll um, and we'll keep the conversation going um, uh, in, in a different form, uh, whether it's a separate meeting or a separate group that we set up to do it, uh, all depends on um, how, how uh, we continue that forward. But um, on behalf of NPLAN, I'd love to thank uh, Yael. Thank you so much for your thoughts, your time. We always appreciate that. And Dougal, thank you as well for your presentation, your thoughts, and for sharing your time with us uh, today. Um, and from the NPLAN team, uh, thank you to everyone who was able to spare some time uh, to be able to join us today. Uh, we appreciate you spending time with us, asking us wonderful questions, uh, and for making this such an interesting topic that uh, will have a massive impact on the way we uh, manage uh, and and, and understand um, really important topics around uncertainty, forecasting, and measurement. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Good night to everybody who's in a different time zone. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye. Nice to meet you.